great to be with all of you today. Thank you. And I have to echo the thank you of all the previous speakers to those who organized this event, to all of you here in the audience. And um, I also have to echo Tom Crowther's apology for my English. <laughs> so yes, I am quite new to Zurich. I'm quite new to this region. And therefore, I will be English speaking. I'm excited to be with you here today to build on the story that Tom Crowther started and tell you more about Restore, which is a science-based tool that we're building to support and accelerate the restoration of Earth's ecosystems. And I wanted to get a sense of those of you in the audience, and because we're just before a coffee break, we probably need some movement anyway. Will you raise your hand for me if you work in forestry, if you're a forestry manager or a landowner? Okay, a good chunk of people. What if um, you're a researcher? Raise your hand, and you can raise your hand twice if needed. Okay, a few. Um, how about an investor? How many investors do we have in here? Some, all right. A government representative? Someone from the nonprofit, great. Someone from the nonprofit world, the NGO world. Oh, there's, there's some over there, great. Um, anyone else? Did I miss anyone? Raise your hand if you're a category that I, okay, I, I, I've missed a few people. It's, it's wonderful to see the diversity um, and, and representation here because ultimately we're trying to build Restore for a multifaceted user base. And I'm really excited to get to learn from all of you. And I will have to admit, and you might not be surprised by this, that you are not my typical audience. I, before Restore, spent a lot of time with palm oil farmers, everyone who had one hectare of palm oil to 25,000 hectares of palm oil. I spent a lot of time with government representatives thinking about protected areas. I spent time with corporates who committed to no deforestation. More recently at Restore, I spend time with corporates who are committed to planting trees. <laughs> I spend time with environmental NGOs and agroforestry networks. But the Austrian and German forestry audience, I will admit, is new, which is very exciting because it means that we have the opportunity to learn and to build a bigger audience. So today I'm going to talk about a, um, why restoration is important. I will show you the Restore platform and describe the science that we house on Restore. I'll tell you a little bit about the community of users who are coming together on Restore, and I'm gonna give you a sense of where we're going from, from here, what's next for us. I'll do this briefly because, oh, skip me forward. I'll do this briefly because I don't think I need to convince many of you about the importance of nature restoration, but I'll echo some of the messages that you've heard before, which is that restoring ecosystems, restoring land is one of the most impactful strategies to be able to protect biodiversity. Restoration is estimated to be able to prevent 60% of expected species extinctions. It's a great strategy to fight climate change, as we've heard. Restoration could draw down an estimated 299 gigatons of carbon, or 30% of what's in the atmosphere today. And it can improve livelihoods for an estimated 1.3 billion people. And when I say restoration, there's a caveat that I want to be able to add here, or maybe an expansion, which is that restoration is not just returning a piece of land to our idea of its natural state. Restoration includes agroforestry, where trees are brought into farming systems to help stabilize soil and retain water and sequester carbon and diversify income streams. It's also wetland remediation. It can be just fencing off an overgrazed grassland and letting it recover. And very importantly to those of you here today, restoration, at least how we choose to see it, is sustainable management of forests. So when I say restoration, I mean all of those things, that big umbrella. So we know restoration is important, and it has local and global benefits, but it's not yet happening at the scale or the speed or the quality globally that is needed to meet the challenges that we face. And in some cases, long-standing restoration systems, like the forestry management that many of you practice, is being threatened by a changing climate and changing environmental conditions. And this is why we built Restore. Restore is this open data platform for global restoration all over the world. 
And over the next few slides, I'll tell you more about the ins and outs of Restore. But at its core, there's two simple and powerful things that we do. We make it easy for anyone, anywhere, to get access to consistent, best-in-class scientific data for anywhere, any area in the world. And we make it possible for anyone doing restoration work to share that publicly. Restore was founded by the Crowther Lab, as you know, at ETH Zurich, and our technology was developed in partnership with Google. We're an official partner of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and at the beginning of this year, we spun off from ETH and formed an independent organization. So we have strong roots in science and in tech, and we have the mandate to chart a direction forward that brings together these worlds to support restoration efforts around the globe. We launched a password-protected version of our platform on June 5th, which was World Environment Day, and it was also the launch of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And just last month, on the 13th of October, we took password protection off of our site and opened it up to the world. Let's see. I, there we go. Movie's playing. So here we are, currently Restore hosts data that is globally available. So I can go anywhere in the world and see the same kind of information. So you can see me trying it out here in this demo. I've zoomed into Tepoztlan, which is outside of Mexico City, and it's where I was living before I moved to Zurich to join Restore. And you can see that I can draw an area that I'm interested in here and see a range of ecological and environmental and socioeconomic data about this site. So you can look at for example, estimated current and potential carbon in the soil. It's loading right now a list of potential plant species, trees and shrubs and herbs that are predicted to occur in this area. And for each of these species, we've included data related to their IUCN red list status and useful traits like rooting depth and edible parts. I'm not going to take you through all of the details of all of these data chapters, but I do encourage you to check it out on our platform. There are a few categories of data that we have on Restore, and Tom told you about some of them. And so I just want to summarize quickly the data layers that we've included that are based on global models. Because we host dozens of these layers, all of them are coming from published scientific literature. And as Tom described, global models rely on hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of points around the world where data has been collected on the ground. Sometimes it's by scientists, sometimes it's by governments, sometimes it's by NGOs, and it's this massive task to compile all of that data. But once that feed is accomplished, that data can be analyzed in order to detect global patterns. This allows scientists like Tom to predict what is happening anywhere on Earth, even in areas where ground data points aren't available. And this is how we get global layers like soil pH or mammal and plant and amphibian species richness or tree restoration potential even when we don't have data points there. Tom mentioned the issue of uncertainty here, um, and a few of the other speakers have as well, and it's hugely important to note that on Restore. And so we've documented everywhere on the platform where our data is coming from, what is the resolution, so that anyone using it can get a sense how useful is this for my particular area, for my particular scale. So next we have... Let's move this forward. Remote sensing data that we host on the platform. What you're seeing right here is Maxar imagery. It's 30 to 50 centimeter resolution data going back to 2011. And we've stitched that together to show how areas are changing over time. It's updated globally every two to three years. And this is the highest visual resolution imagery that we have. It's pretty incredible to see almost every tree on Earth but we haven't yet included derived analytics from this data. And the Crowther Lab is working on some really exciting research using machine learning approaches to assess actually spectral diversity of these images, which will be a proxy for biodiversity. So we're looking forward to a future when Restore can automatically detect monoculture reforestation efforts versus mixed stand forests, for example. Moving from finer to coarser, and you're not seeing this here, so you'll have to imagine, Restore also hosts Sentinel imagery, which is 10 meter resolution. It goes back either to 2017 or 2019, depending on your location, and it's updated multiple times a year. 
And this imagery is used to derive land cover maps um, like the one that was released earlier this year by Esri. We host several data layers that are derived from 30 meter resolution Landsat imagery, and that's also updated multiple times a year, but it goes all the way go back to 1984. One of these layers is NDVI, which essentially measures the greenness of a site. It's a good proxy for growth and early stages of a restoration project. And another set of layers that are derived from this Landsat data are the Hansen tree cover and tree cover loss data, which are also display displayed on WRI's Global Forest Watch. This is what allows us to track deforestation around the globe. And after COP26, there's going to be an increasing focus on measuring this to achieve a 1.5 degree world. And then finally, I'll mention NASA's MODA sensor, which has also been um, talked about today, which allows us to host net primary productivity and evapotranspiration data. That's at a 500 meter resolution, going back to 2000. It might sound like a long laundry list of imagery options, but there were two guiding principles for us as we selected the data to display on our platform. One is global coverage, as I mentioned. So every data set, every imagery set I just mentioned is available everywhere. And we've also chosen a range of spatial and temporal resolution. So very high resolution data um, where you can see, as I say, almost every tree, and then data that's available far back in time. Now, I've told you about data that Restore hosts and makes readily available. But for me, one of the most interesting pieces of data on Restore is data which is reported by restoration sites. So every site on Restore has an associated profile that's filled out by the manager of that site. And here is where sites can share information about their restoration interventions and goals, their challenges and needs, their progress, and really any other information they think is important. We have a data upload option so that forest inventories or seedling survival rates or soil samples can be shared directly with us. And then we've included required optional and custom data fields on Restore. So every site manager has the option to share their site publicly or keep that site private. And so it's possible to access Restore's data, even if you're not ready to make your site visible to the world. One of the most exciting aspects of Restore for me about from a data perspective is the interaction between the various different kinds of data that I just mentioned. So at Restore, we're sharing global data from models and remote sensing with restoration projects all over the world. And today, that's about 75,000 projects. And in turn, they're sharing data from the ground back with us. We're partnering with scientists around the world to be able to analyze this data in order to improve global models and advanced restoration science. And so we're building this massive feedback loop that has the potential to greatly accelerate restoration research and restoration impact. I've spent the last seven minutes or so talking about data on Restore. But I do have to let you in on a secret now, which is that I don't actually think that the data on Restore is the most important thing that we do. Data is often one barrier for restoration success, but we know that there are many, many other barriers that must become in order to achieve quality restoration at the speed and scale that we and our planet need. What you're seeing right now is the simple filter function that we've built in Restore, which allows restoration funders to narrow in on projects of interest. It allows projects to find each other and learn from each other and encourage each other. It allows everyday people to search for volunteer opportunities so they can become a part of restoration. Ultimately, Restore is about connecting. It's about making visible. And it's about inspiring new restoration efforts around the world based on what's already happening. So I want to give a sense of who is on Restore today. Since the beta launched back in June, we've been really honored to welcome these 75,000 restoration and conservation sites around the world that are managed by over 5,000 restoration practitioners who are now users of Restore. These sites are spread across 110 different countries and they cover 14 biomes, although I could admit to all of you in this crowd of foresters that the vast majority of these sites are forest sites. And the numbers are growing every day as the word of Restore spreads. I love these numbers because they do give us a sense of the scale of restoration out there. 
but they also risk eclipsing the people and projects behind the numbers. Tom told you about Desta and his coffee forest, and you watched the trailer about Sophia. And last month, I actually had the opportunity to take a walk with her and her friend and neighbor and colleague, who also happens to be named Sophia. And so I wanted to tell you a bit more about their story and how it intertwines with Restore. As you saw, in 2017, their hometown of Adega and Pedro Gao in Portugal was devastated by forest fires. The fires burned for over eight days. They killed 66 people, and they injured more than 200. It's always hard to attribute a cause to a single blaze, but there are often common conditions that drive the most disastrous ones, and we do know that those conditions are becoming more frequent with our warming planet. In Pedro Gao, it was this extensive monoculture plantation of the non-native eucalyptus trees, which turned into a tinderbox um, after uh, an early heat wave in the summer. And then a lightning strike in the end was what lit that match. And so what happened afterwards, you saw a bit of it, but of course there's mourning. And there's also this question of what do we do next? And Sophia, who's a forest engineer, took the lead, determined to drive a restoration effort that would create a more diverse and resilient landscape and minimize chances of another catastrophic fire. She met with landowners to discuss options, hoping to find allies in that goal. And at schools and with some community groups, she did find a receptive audience. But with many of the larger landowners, she also found a business-as-usual attitude, which was understandable. They were planning to plant eucalyptus again because it grows fast and it sells easily. And so Sophia really began to ask herself, what could be planted here other than eucalyptus monocultures that would bring economic value? How could she make the case to local government that the regulations governing land use really needed to be updated? How could she find other groups who would face similar challenges that she could learn from? How could she raise funds, ultimately, to support her work? Sophia definitely still has many questions, but I am excited that in Restore, she's found a place where she's beginning to find support and even some answers to those questions. Here you can see the areas, some of the areas in 2017 that fires left barren, and Sophia's working with communities to restore these sites. She's specified that she's looking for financial support for this work, and she's left links to a donation website, contact information. You can see that she's fared photos to help bring her project to life here online. And she, like every other site on Restore, now has access to ecological, environmental, and socioeconomic data from Restore. So she can see estimates of current and potential carbon in the soil and net primary productivity of her site. I love this graph because you can actually see those NPP numbers, which is describing the rate, right, at which carbon is accumulating in living plants. You can see it drop down in 2017 in response to the fires, and then you can see how it begins to rebound after that. So now, if Sophia wants to consider carbon credits as a potential revenue source, she has a place to start, a free place to start for assessing possibilities. You can see that she can, as you saw earlier, she can also look at potential species for this area. She can look at basic environmental data on temperature and precipitation and soil pH. She can access that high-resolution imagery to be able to track change over time. It's important to say that Restore can't solve all of Sophia's problems, and you know that, and I know that. The technical challenge and the data limitations restoration projects face also intertwine with all of these social problems and economic challenges, and they require deep and local and systematic engagement. Restoration is messy. Changing the way that people use land is messy. But our goal at Restore is to make it easier and faster for every project around the world to be able to overcome these barriers. We want to share data, enable connections with peers and funders and volunteers, and facilitate transparency to build trust and accountability. As we continue to build Restore, because what you've seen today is just the beginning, we'll continue to focus on eliminating barriers to success for restoration projects around the world. We have a lot of ideas about how to do this. We'd love to see every tree nursery on, on Restore with their own profile. 
We imagine hosting carbon certification schemes and drone, drone imagery providers. We'll keep bringing the latest science onto the platform and the best satellite imagery. We can't wait to be mobile optimized. If you're playing around with Restore on your phone right now, you're going to find it annoying and hard. <laughs> we need more languages. So we're about to release Spanish, Portuguese, and French, but we need German, <laughs> we need Hindi, and we need Chinese, and we need to expand. And finally, we're really committed to listening to ideas from anyone involved and restoration around the world to improve what we do. So I'm going to end with an invitation and a request. Check out Restore. Today, there are only six sites in Austria of those 75,000. So add yours. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. Let us know how we might make your work a little bit easier. I already got some great advice over lunch, so I know there are many, many, many ideas out there. Thank you.